In this lecture, we're going to talk about how pH affects molecular structure. First, let's talk about pH and the henderson hasselbalch equation. We report the concentration of H3O plus as pH. You can calculate pH by taking the late negative log of the concentration of your H3O plus or hydronium. The henderson hasselbalch equation tells us that the pH is equal to pKa plus the log of concentration of A minus over concentration of HA. Remember that HA is your acid and A minus is your conjugate base. So what this really tells us is that when we have the concentration of A minus and the concentration of HA are equal, then the pH and the pKa are equal. So at 50% dissociation, pH is equal to pKa. Now what does this mean exactly? That means that when half of our acid has reacted, we are in a situation where our pH and our pKa are equal. So let's talk a little bit more about what the henderson hasselbalch equation means. We said that when pH is equal to pKa, we have 50% dissociation. Let's look at this example here where we have an acidic form of a compound and we have a basic form. That means that for this compound, and if you were to look it up, this compound has a pKa of 5.2. So at 5.2, at a pH of 5.2, we are going to have 50% of the acidic form and 50% of the basic form. That only happens at a pH of 5.2 because according to the henderson hasselbalch equation, when those two amounts are equal, so when your acidic concentration of your acid is equal to the concentration of your conjugate base, that's when we are going to have the pH equal to the pKa. So that means that anything below a pH of 5.2 or a situation that's more acidic than 5.2, you are going to have more acidic form. So if we drop pH, remember that pH is a measure of our acid strength. If we drop a pH, we're going to end up with more of the acidic form. And if we increase the pH, we're going to end up with more of the basic form. At exactly 5.2, and that's because for this molecule our pKa is 5.2. At exactly 5.2, we'll have half of the acidic form and half of the basic form. As our pH increases and we get more basic, we'll see more basic form. And as our pH decreases and we get more acidic, we'll see more of the acidic form. So just to recap what I went over, pH gives us information about the acidity of the solution. It tells us how acidic it is and we could make our solution more acidic or less acidic by adding acid or base. pKa, though, tells us information about the strength of the acid. The pKa of the molecule isn't going to change. It's always going to have the same pKa, but the pKa is going to tell us at a given pH if it's protonated or deprotonated in its acidic form or in its basic form. When I say protonated, I mean acidic form. When I say deprotonated, I mean basic form. Together with pH and pKa, we can get information about the percent dissociation. So we can tell at a given pH how much dissociation we have. There are equations for this in case you're curious. Our percent dissociation is calculated as our concentration of A- minus at equilibrium. Remember A- minus is our conjugate base and the initial concentration of HA. If you rearrange this, that means that percent dissociation is equal to the concentration of A minus at equilibrium over the concentration of HA at equilibrium plus A minus at equilibrium. You multiply by, that by 100% and that will get you your percent dissociation. But what do we really care about? What we really care about in the take home message here is how pH and pKa are going to relate to our structure. 
So if you have a solution that is more acidic than the pKa, you are going to have a solution where your pH is less than your pKa. In those situations, you have a protonated molecule. The proton is on, or you are in the acidic form. In a solution that is more basic than your pKa, that means the pH is greater than your pKa, the molecule is deprotonated and your proton comes off or you're in the basic form. Let's look at this example that we use in the lab. In Chem 3301, we use pH to do laboratory separations. So let's take a look at benzoic acid over here. Now benzoic acid, you don't have to know the pKa directly of benzoic acid, but it's a carboxylic acid, so you can go ahead and assume that the pKa is about five. And that means that if we want to form benzoic acid, we have to have an acidic solution where a pH is below five. In a basic solution, benzoic acid is going to get deprotonated and form sodium benzoate. So in order this, to get this reaction to work in the lab, we have to add HCl. We add HCl, which is a very strong acid. Remember, it's gonna have a negative pKa value. And we add enough C HCl to our reaction solution to make sure that the pH of the solution is below five or more acidic than five. Once we've dropped the pH to about one, and that's plenty, that means that we will have primarily the protonated form. If we were to ha have base, benzoic acid would get deprotonated and go back and form sodium benzoate. So this is a kind of a cool application of using all of this knowledge of pH and pKa in the lab. We can also apply this to solubility. So you'll notice this cool thing down here, it's called a separatory funnel, and it's going to separate compounds based on their solubility. Notice that the ether layer on top, and you, it's really hard to see, but there's a little line here that's showing, that's showing the difference between the two layers. The ether layer will solubilize organic compounds, and the water layer will dissolve, of course, water-soluble compounds like salts. So if we were to do a reaction as shown above, that means that something like sodium benzoate, which has an ion, an ionic bond, should dissolve in the water layer. And something like benzoic acid up here should dissolve in the organic or ether layer. So you could separate a mixture of these two compounds by taking advantage of the pH and the pKa and their solubility properties. Interestingly, when we do this reaction in the lab, sodium benzoate, we dissolve it in water, we add our HCl, and benzoic acid instantly crashes out and you can just filter it out because uh, benzoic acid is so insoluble. This is a good place to pause the video and do some clicker questions. Let's use what we learned about pH and pKa to talk about the structure of amino acids. So here we have an alpha amino acid shown here, and we have a carboxylic acid on our right and an amine on our left. And the R group, of course, can be lots of different things. And the structure of the amino acid actually is gonna depend on the pH of the solution. Remember when we were talking about amino acids in chapter one, we talked about how maybe sometimes that carboxylic acid could be deprotonated and sometimes that amine could be shown as protonated. So let's look at those pKa's. Down here on the left, you can see that the carboxylic acid pKa is shown to be about two. And the pKa of the ammonium is shown to be in about nine to 10. So this pKa over here is about nine to 10. So that means in acidic conditions, we are going to see the acidic form of both of these molecules. And by acidic conditions, I mean a pH of about one. So this will be protonated, the carboxylic acid will be protonated at a pH of one, the ammonium will be protonated at a pH of one. As we increase the pH and we get to be a little bit more basic, the most acidic hydrogen will come off. In that case, our most acidic hydrogen is the one with the lower pKa, the one with the pKa of two. 
as that comes off, we're going to form our carboxylate. So the carboxylic acid is deprotonated, and this forms the carboxylate. And that's going to happen as we go up above the pK of 2. So this would happen at pK of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. Now at 9, we said that the ammonium had a pK of about 9. At 9, this one's going to start to come off. And so as we increase the pKa, we are going to see that both of these are deprotonated. So let's say we have a pH of a solution of 11. That means that the most acidic hydrogen is going to be deprotonated to form the carboxylate. And also, the ammonium proton is going to come off. So what you need to be able to do for an exam is to go through and look at an amino acid and given the pH of a solution, identify what the structure is. Here are some more examples. So here's an amino acid, and at a pH of 0, it's showing that the carboxylic acid and the amine are both protonated. At a pH of 7, we've increased the pH enough that the carboxylic acid becomes deprotonated, but the ammonium is still protonated. This form is called a zwitter ion because it has both a positive and a negative charge. As we increase the pH even more, so now we're going up to 11, we'll see that we have a negative charge in the carboxylic acid because that's still deprotonated. And now the ammonium has been deprotonated and we have the free amine. So the pH of 7 is where we're going to get the zwitter ion. And that is why you often see carboxylic acid shown in their zwitter ionic form because pH 7 is approximately physiological pH, meaning that that's the pH that is occurring in your body. Here's another example. In this one, we're looking at histidine. Histidine is neat because it has one, two, three acidic hydrogens that we need to worry about. At a low pH, or pH of zero, all of these are going to be protonated because we have a more acidic solution. As we increase the pH and we get a little bit basic, the most acidic of these is going to be our carboxylic acid. That's going to start to pop off, and we end up with the carboxylate. So this is our most acidic hydrogen. At a pH of 4, you can see that we, our most acidic hydrogen has come off. We increase the pH a little bit more, and now our next most acidic hydrogen over here on the R group. That one has now come off. And we increase the pH all the way to 12, and now we have our fully deprotonated molecule. Both of our amines are in the free amine form, and our, carboxylate, our carboxylic acid has been deprotonated to form the carboxylate. That concludes this video on how pH affects molecular structure. In the next video, we're going to talk about reaction coordinate diagrams, thermodynamics, and kinetics.